Welcome. My name is Zach Biggs, and I'm the research coordinator for international policy and trade at the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. Uh, we are Canada's leading policy school, known for our practical research and for bringing people together to discuss important issues, which is what we're here to do today. So today is another installment in our webinar series on COVID-19's public policy implications. Uh, we will post a recording of this webinar on our website and our YouTube channel, where you'll also find our previous webinars in this series. And you'll also receive a link to this presentation by email in the next few days. So today's webinar will focus on Canada-China relations in the COVID era. Uh, this is a relationship that was already strained and now the pandemic has added further stresses. So will the relationship further deteriorate or might this be an opportunity to make some progress? We have two experts joining us today to get you some answers. Our first speaker today is Hugh Stevens. He's a distinguished fellow at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, an executive fellow at the School of Public Policy and vice chair of the Canadian Committee on Pacific Economic Cooperation. Our second speaker today is Margaret McQuaig Johnston. She's a senior fellow at the Institute for Science, Society and Policy at Ottawa U. She's a senior fellow with the University of Alberta's China Institute. And she's a distinguished fellow with the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. And something interesting about our two experts today is we realized during our pre-webinar prep chat that they actually first met in Beijing or Peking as it was known then in 1979 at a party at the Canadian Embassy. So they may have known each other for quite some time, but I will encourage them to counter one another. Uh, I think today's topic is one that is thought provoking and, and deserving of an honest and spirited dialogue. So we've chosen to tweak our format today to try to make it more conversational. Uh, we'll start by giving each speaker about seven minutes to state their key points. And then I'll then give them about 10 minutes to respond to one another. After that, I'll open it up for audience question and answer. And please enter your questions in the Q&A box below. You'll see that at the bottom of your screen and I will take your questions and pose them to our speakers. So I now like to turn the presentation over to Hugh for his opening remarks. Hugh, take it away. Thank you very much, Zach. Uh, well, certainly that reference to 1979 somewhat dates us, but uh, anyway, as you say, it was an interesting little sideline to. Uh, trip down uh, memory lane. Well, so good morning, everybody uh, out here in BC and good afternoon, I guess, to the rest of Canada. Um, as Zach mentioned, my topic today is on Canada-China relations in the age of COVID. Uh, what impact is it having on our relationship? What impact could it have? Does it pose a threat or is it an opportunity? And maybe a little bit of both. Um, there's really no question that it's put additional strain on our relationship, and I'll come to that. Uh, but the question that I would like to explore is, uh, to what extent does this provide an opportunity for uh, constructive re-engagement uh, in our relationship with China? And I'm going to argue uh, more on the positive side that this is an more of an opportunity than a threat for the, for the following reasons. I think it's important to seize this opportunity in order to get relations with China back on an even keel. Why is this? Well, perhaps for some obvious reasons, probably the most foremost reason is to try and do what we can to uh, get the two Michaels out of the purgatory in which they've been finding themselves now for more than uh, 500 days, but also to stand up for Canadian values, rule of law, to make us effective advocates. There's also, of course, an important business and trade relationship uh, to look after. China will continue to be important to Canada and to the global economy. We shared some, uh, we have some shared global interests with China, notably on the issue of climate change, but also on health. And finally, there's the people to people factor, immigration, family, and so on. So I would argue that we need to get, uh, we need to get dialogue restarted and that COVID does provide, in essence, uh, bizarrely kind of an opportunity to, to do that. Now, of course, there are people that don't believe we should be looking for an opportunity. So if you really think that uh, the future is economic decoupling from China, or that China is an advocate that we need to contain, then perhaps uh, the blame game is, is, is one that, uh, that uh, suits your line of thinking. Uh, that's, not my, that's not my position, and I think we should be seizing this opportunity. Now, as I mentioned, um, the relationship is already under great stress, probably the worst it's ever been in the 50 years since we established relations with China. 
Um, the Meng Wanzhou situation, the arrest in Vancouver in uh, December of 2018, the retaliation by China to arrest Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, uh, retaliatory trade actions that were taken last year, even being uh, sideswiped as part of collateral damage by the US-China relationship, uh, the US attempt to push a managed trade solution on China, uh, requiring China to purchase from US suppliers where they may not be actually the most effective competitors. And it even uh, touches on another issue that we're facing in Canada, uh, the whole question of Huawei's participation in uh, the 5G rollout in Canada. Uh, and, and Canada's under a lot of pressure from the US on this particular issue. In fact, one uh, under a lot of pressure on a number of areas. Uh, Meng Wanzhou was because of US pressure. Uh, and then we had Mr. Trump's musing that perhaps she could be traded off for a trade deal and so forth. So it's been, it's been, uh, it's been stressful. And COVID has only, in a sense, made things worse because of the Chinese initial reaction and initial cover-up. Uh, so there's been lots of opportunity to uh, play the blame game if that's what you want to do. Uh, the most recent Angus Reid poll I saw showed that just 14% of Canadians have a positive image of China. That's down by about half. It was around 30-35% maybe uh, uh, earlier this year. So that makes it very difficult for the government, uh, which has to move in ch in, in, to a certain extent in, in rhythm with public uh, opinion to do very much. There have been other issues, of course, the issue of Taiwan and the WHO. Uh, stories about faulty Chinese PPE coming in, and then when China made efforts to correct that, there are lots of quality assurance problems with products in China. Uh, as anybody will know, and you really do need a good quality assurance system, when China made efforts to, uh, to deal with that, then they were accused of imposing red tape and blocking exports. Uh, in fact, China uh, has become the supplier of last resort. It has not resorted to export controls as many countries have, not Canada, but many other countries, and has certainly not threatened uh, to, to uh, embargo the export of N95 masks to Canada, as we know was uh, 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 proposed by the Trump administration. China has been donating PPE and has been criticized for that even. So, I mean, it's one of these things where if you want to find uh, something to criticize, COVID has provided lots of opportunity. Um, and, and the public commentary has continued. There's a real drumbeat of this every day. But I feel that this is not really a productive way to go from a Canadian point of view. So let me just review some of the areas where I think Canada uh, has differentiated itself from, from some others and where this can be, can be turned to our advantage. First of all, uh, as has been made evident by commentary in the press, the Canadian government has been careful not to point the finger of blame at China or to market unsubstantiated conspiracy theories about where the virus may or may not have started. Uh, we did send help to China early uh, in February when China was at the center of this, uh, of this crisis, uh, help that was appreciated and which has been criticized in this country, but uh, I think there were good reasons to do it. Excuse me. We've continued to engage in scientific and medical cooperation with China just the last day or so. There's been stories of cooperation between the NRC and labs in China working toward a solution. And we've been careful to follow a science-based approach in terms of determining uh, what the cause of this may have been and, and avoid politicizing the question of where the virus came from. We will need to find out where the virus came from. That's going to be part of the efforts as we exit from COVID. But there's no need to unduly politicize this particular issue, or as I say, engage in some, uh, some speculation and conspiracy theories. So summary in both tone and substance, the Canadian position has been much more nuanced, to put it politely, much more positive than the position of the United States. And this brings me to my point. I think this presents us an opportunity in terms of resetting our relationship with China. One, which I hope China will respond to, and one can never be sure, but it does present some opportunities for dialogue to work together to improve the environment and to work toward a solution to this problem which is affecting us both on the health and economic front. What impact will it have on the Meng Wanzhou case? Uh, I mean, that really rests with the courts and I wish the courts would move quickly on this and, and, and come to some sort of resolution so we could, we could move ahead. Will it help the two Michaels? Um, that's hard to say, but I don't see how it could hurt. Um, what about the 5G issue? Uh, that's really a separate issue, but I do think it's important not to confound the 5G decision and COVID, not to make a decision on 5G to punish China for COVID. I think that decision needs to be uh, made on its own merits. And uh, there's lots of points, both 
on both sides of this to keep Huawei completely out of our 5G networks. Uh, as probably most of you know, they do supply equipment to our 4G networks or the British solution, which personally I favor, which is to allow uh, limited participation, um, maintaining our security and, uh, and taking advantage of the technological and industrial benefits that will come with accessing uh, supplies from that particular company. So to wrap up, I guess my point is that blaming China may be very satisfying. And in fact, it serves some political agendas as we're seeing, but in the end is not productive. Demonizing China solves nothing and does not advance Canadian interests. And so my, my, my position, my case, I guess, is that the response to COVID-19 provides us with an opportunity to reestablish a more productive dialogue with China. And I believe that we should use this, use this opportunity to do so. So thank you, I'll stop there. And uh, I guess I turn my video off, do I, uh, Zach? Yes, yeah, so thank you for that, Hugh. And now we'll hear Margaret's opening statement. Uh, Margaret, are you ready? Yes, I am. Uh, Great. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today with my colleague Hugh and your viewers to talk about Canada-China relations in the age of COVID. I come to the issues from the perspective of a friend of China for 40 years including as an assistant deputy minister and member of the Canada-China Joint Committee on Science and Technology for seven years. But I was in China when Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor were detained and Robert Schellenberg and later Fan Wei were given execution sentences in direct retaliation for the arrest of Meng Wanzhou. My own locked suitcases in my hotel room were searched. And in a meeting with a Chinese national in Shanghai, I mentioned the detentions and he told me that China has a list of 100 Canadians they can pick up and detain at any time. This is no way for any country to treat its friends and taking innocent hostages is downright medieval. That's why I decided to speak out a year and a half ago, having never given an interview or written an op-ed before in my career. But wanting our Canadians released does not mean that we should send Madame Meng home. We have a system based on the principles of the rule of law in Canada, and we must comply with that. In fact, countries like Japan that did cave into China in past when Japanese citizens were kidnapped in retaliation for a perceived slight, soon found more of their citizens kidnapped the very next time China wanted to bring pressure on Japan to get in line. The fact that many like-minded countries have supported Canada in our calls for our citizens to be released demonstrates to China that it's offside civilized norms of international behavior. China's attitude has continued during the COVID crisis. Canada delayed by many weeks its announcement that our border would be closed and never singled China out. During that time, the Chinese ambassador, as Hugh said, commended us for continued, to continuing to stay open to arriving Chinese and not following the US in its closure of flights. But when asked if this would improve Canada-China relations, Ambassador Tsung Peiyu said, quote, overall relations remain tense due to the outstanding issue for the bilateral relationship. So no, our help to them did not improve the relationship. And the minute that foreigners started bringing COVID into China, she ordered China's flights and borders closed. There was no reciprocity for Canada's support of China. China's also pushed back hard, as we know, on the call from Ch Australia, the US and others that there should be an inve investigation into, in China into how COVID started, choosing instead to pin the blame first on an American military officer and later on an Italian for starting COVID in Wuhan. The truth matters when you're trying to understand the nature and spread of a pandemic. And there's quite a bit we know already, which I can get into in the discussion. It's been pointed out that Canada has not called for an investigation in China, although the PM did say yesterday that several countries, particularly China, are going to have to explain themselves. And we have called for a review of the actions of the WHO. But how tough on China can the Canadian government be now? We currently need PPE from China, which exports 25% of the world's face masks. And the PM has determined that Canadian lives are more important at this moment than calling out China. In one case, the PPE from China was donated by Huawei. And even though they donated it to the Canada-China Friendship Society, it was Huawei executives, not the society's leaders, 
who visited the various hospitals with boxes of PPE for photos to be taken of the company's generosity to Canada. It looked more like a promotion for 5G than a gift. Those countries calling for an investigation of the virus are now being threatened by China that they will not get PPE. And in fact, Australia has already seen its meat exports to China banned as retaliation. Seriously, this is a real and consistent tactic that China uses with middle powers and smaller powers, and companies and their employees are paying the consequences. The Canada-China Business Council, um, in its report last Friday, found a huge impact on Canadian businesses in the past year. 51% had their deals postponed, 40% saw their deals cancelled, and 63% cancelled employee travel. At some point, we will have secured sufficient sources outside China for our PPE, including companies in Canada that have stepped up to start manufacturing it. At that point, I expect we'll see Canada joining other countries in calling for an investigation of the origins of the virus in Wuhan. It's critically important to learn the facts or it's going to happen again. It's not pointing fingers, it's member nations of the WHO asking substantive questions and providing clear answers, China providing clear answers. We would expect no less of any other country. At the same time, we know that China isn't going away. And in my view, we will need a medium to long-term approach to deal with this new, more aggressive China that kidnaps innocent people and pushes around middle powers to put us in our place of deference to China. That's why I have recommended to Global Affairs Canada that the government develop a new Indo-Pacific strategy that would broaden and deepen our economic, trade, security, and cultural relations with many other countries in the region, including Taiwan, and develop a new approach to dealing with the new China we are seeing, one that takes account of China's relations with other countries in the region. In that regard, I was very pleased to learn that following his departmental briefings on China's use of aggressive political and economic levers to punish Canada, the Minister of Foreign Affairs has indicated the need to explore a new framework for Canada-China relations. My hope is that in the coming months that framework will be put in the broader context of a new Indo-Pacific strategy. In the meantime, Canadian companies with operations in China will need to ensure that their markets are fully diversified so that if they are hit with sudden arbitrary Chinese government actions, they will be agile enough to do without their Chinese market for a period of time. In the Yeet Yu, the restrictions on exports from China of critical medical equipment brought on by the closing of China's ports due to the COVID measures and their broken contracts to EU countries for ventilators has prompted EU governments to look at being what they call strategically autonomous. And together with EU companies, they are now moving to build more resilient supply chains based on diversification. Similarly, Japan has earmarked $2.2 billion US to help manufacturers shift production away from China. These actions are not based on suspicions of the Communist Party. They're based on China's repeated international and bilateral behaviors. Companies and countries and companies would have to be foolish to ignore these actions and move forward naively waiting for them to happen again. It's sad that our relations in, with China have come to this after all the investments that Canadians and Canadian companies have made in building friendships and businesses there. But even longtime friends of China like myself are saying that they've gone too far. China needs to reassess its own international position to treat other nations like Canada with respect and to stop kidnapping our citizens and holding them for ransom. That's it, and I'm welcome to, happy to go to a discussion now. Great, thank you, Margaret. So yeah, we'll start the discussion now. Um, one area in which it sounds like there might be some difference in your guys' views on the situation was, uh, Hugh spoke a few times about not playing the blame game. Um, does, does this specifically refer to just the, the potential origin of the coronavirus, or do you mean that more broadly in that Canada shouldn't be calling out what we perceive as, as bad behavior by the government of China. Um, because to me, it sounded like Margaret is kind of saying, um, clearly the Chinese government is treating Canadians 
inappropriately. They've detained two Canadians. They've executed a few Canadians. And, and we should not just lie down and take it. We should stand up for ourselves. Um, am I right in sensing that there's a, a, a difference in your two opinion on that area? And Hugh, just a reminder, please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you, Zach. Since I did talk about the blame game, um, you know, I thought we were going to have a lot to disagree on, but in fact, I find it very difficult to disagree with just about anything that, that Margaret said. Although I would say that uh, while she said that she's a she's been a friend of China for forty years, I've been looking at China for a very long time. In fact, I was serving at the Canadian Embassy in Beijing when we first unknowingly met. Um, but I would never have, I would really wouldn't put myself in the camp of being a friend of China or an enemy of China, frankly. I, I'm, I'm, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly when it's come to China. It's got lots of potential, but uh, it's certainly over the years behaved in ways that have been unacceptable to uh, the global community. Uh, it was moving in a direction that uh, we in the West considered uh, we were more comfortable with, and now in the last four or five years, it certainly turned in a different direction. So I guess I would just would, would make that point. My, my uh, reference to not playing the blame game relates to COVID. Uh, and we're talking about foreign policy or bilateral relations in the age of COVID. I don't think that, uh, I, I mean, there's always a balance between blaming and, and trying to find solutions. Um, simply blaming China uh, or criticizing China uh, without offering some constructive solutions or finding ways to engage or finding ways to have dialogue is not going to be very productive. It's quite satisfying. Uh, to some people, um, but I don't. I, you know, I I, I think that uh, on the on the COVID issue, this is something where we have shared interests and that we can find some common ground. What you want to find in diplomacy is common ground, so that then you can deal with the issues where there isn't common ground. And clearly, with the biggest issue is the uh, is the seizure uh, of uh, Michael Kovrig and, uh, and 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 Michael Spavor. I am. I agree 100% with, uh, with Margaret. This is unacceptable way for a major power for any country, frankly, to behave. And we need to continue to work on a, on a solution. So I guess the short answer is I'm talking about COVID. Uh, it's, an, it's an opportunity to blame China and to point the finger and to, and to push them further into the corner uh, uh, along with all the other issues. Or could we use it as a way to try and get this dialogue being started so that a lot of these other issues, which are uh, which reflect a, a degree of behavior that is unacceptable Canadians could perhaps be worked on. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I appreciate those comments that, that Hugh's made. And, and he, he's right that as a, a foreign service officer, as a diplomat for Canada, uh, he is neutral. He is not a friend or a opponent of whatever country he's, uh, he's posted in. He has to t look analytically at what they, they are doing. I was a friend of China for almost 40 years. And I was vice president of the Canada-China Friendship Society from 2014 to 16. Um, however, China has changed dramatically in the last couple of years under Xi Jinping, starting with the um, South China Sea militarization of the, their islands, uh, the treatment of uh, human rights activists and lawyers in, in China in 2015, they threw hundreds of them into prison. Um, the treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, the surveillance state that they have created with the social credit system, uh, tabulating scores for each individual as to how, how positive they are about Xi Jinping and the Communist Party, and punishing them if they're not positive enough. And now that's been extended to corporations. So I've, I've really looked at China's behavior and said, and the thing that put me over the edge, of course, was when I, I was in China when our uh, Canadians were detained. And I, I, to this day, can't attend meetings of the uh, Canada-China Friendship Society or attend events at the embassy. I've turned down a, a position at the uh, Shanghai Science and Technology Policy Institute. I can't bear to be in the room with a government, people of a government who, um, who have done this to our people. And uh, so I'm, I'm coming at it from China's behavior and um, I'm saying, you know, enough is enough. Yes, um, Ch Canada should be calling China on these actions. Uh, but right now, I think the prime minister's right. We need to get our PPE. We need to protect our people. And as the, we go through the pandemic and, uh, and get it under control, 
there will be a time when we can go back and revisit what happened. Can I just add, Zach, I think it's more than just PPE. I, I, I do agree that we want to keep PPE, the supply coming, but uh, um, I think there's more than that reason to try and re-engage with China. And uh, I think in terms of cooperative uh, S&T exchange market, that's an area that you've done a lot of work in. Um, uh, you know, China certainly bears a, a good chunk of blame for what happened, but there's lots of blame to go around. I mean, other countries haven't handled the response very well. We are now in a situation where everybody is working on a solution. Uh, China has a lot of expertise. Um, there's work going on there, there's work going on in Canada, there's work going on around the world. I think if we didn't, if we don't use this opportunity to double down on finding areas where we can cooperate and finding something positive, in terms of finding a solution to this uh, particular issue, the COVID issue, then we're missing an opportunity. And if we can find some common ground here, perhaps that will open dialogue, open ways to perhaps resolve some of these other issues. Some of them are, 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 are intractable. I mean, I, I, I don't have a key to, to unlock this Rubik's Cube of Meng Wanzhou and the two Michaels. It's not easy, but I do think that uh, lack of dialogue is not going to advance the solution. Well, and I think it's also important to uh, be able to go back to the origins of the pandemic and find out what happened so that it, we can do things so that it won't happen again. And frankly, a lot of the problem that we find ourselves in uh, in Canada now is because of the early cover-ups. You know, the Wuhan officials um, detained eight doctors who were just on a private chat talking about uh, the virus and exchanging uh, ideas. Two of those later died. Um, the, a Chinese lab developed a genome sequence for the virus, and the leader of the lab was detained. Um, by this, you know, put in prison and interrogated. They're not just sitting in a hotel. Um, and the colleagues later published, two weeks later, published the genome sequencing, and the Chinese government then, tried, then uh, uh, deleted it from the entire Chinese internet. But by then, foreign scientists had seen it. Um, and, you know, the, the flights from Wuhan to other parts of China were all shut down, but flights continued for weeks after to be going to other uh, countries. So there were a lot of actions that uh, China took um, in the early days that are just the nature of um, um, an autocratic society uh, where you try to suppress any bad news and, you, you know, Wuhan numbers uh, were kept small because they were under pressure from Beijing to keep their numbers small. Uh, at one point, they, people were saying they're too small, and so they put them up 37% uh, in terms of the number of deaths. They still didn't count the cases that where people were asymptomatic. So there, there are a lot of things that need to be looked at. Uh, I, I fully expect that we won't get transparency from China. They tried all these other measures to cover it up, and I don't think they're going to open their books and open their policies and, and, and shine a new light on them. I, I don't expect that to happen, but other countries need to ask the questions. Well, you know, I'm not going to make excuses for what happened in Wuhan, but all I would say is that hindsight is always 2020, and I think anybody looking back could have made other decisions on this, and there's no question that the Chinese could. And in fact, they're paying the price for it as well. I'm sure that there's some regrets that uh, they silenced uh, Dr. Lee and others and didn't take his warnings more seriously at the beginning. Um, and, uh, you know, the crucial six days in Wuhan when maybe they should have shut down things earlier or not. We can, we can go back and, and, and uh, you know, comb through the entrails of all of this uh, indefinitely, but I think the key thing is going to be where did this virus come from? Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, what, what needed to be done or what needs to be done to make sure it doesn't happen again? And at the end of the day, I think we should base our, our solution or, or the answers to this on a science-based analysis. And my understanding is the Chinese have not, uh, have, have not disagreed with this, that they're prepared to, to cooperate. As I think they will have to cooperate at the end of the day in finding a solution. But to, to overly politicize it and to go through as to who said what at what given time, I just don't think is helpful at this particular point. I don't see that as politicizing it. I see that as pointing out that we need some answers because we have thousands of Canadians dying and you know mil millions of cases around the world. So. Uh, I don't, I, I don't, I don't politicize things. I look at China's behaviors and I don't like the behaviors. Maybe we should go to some questions, Zach. What do you think? 
Sounds good. Yes, I, I enjoyed the, the exchange, however. Um, so one of these questions is uh, specifically saying it's for Hugh. Um, it says that uh, you mentioned that you, uh, you mentioned about bringing the Canada-China relationship back to an even keel. Um, what exactly did you mean by that? Does that mean striving to return to the relationship we had with China before the Meng detainment? Or does it mean Canada actually standing up for itself when China acts against Canadian interests? Well, I don't think the relationship is ever going to go back to the way it was before the arrest of Meng Wanzhou. I mean, there's been too much poison poured down the well for that to happen. Uh, by an even keel, I mean getting back on, on, onto a relationship where we can have a, a dialogue, an honest dialogue on issues where we can start, we, we can start rebuilding relationships by finding areas of common interests. And that's normally how you do it. You find something that you agree on, because lots that we don't, we don't agree on, and, uh, and, and, and trying to uh, build that dialogue. It, China, like, like Canada, is a multifaceted place. There are various uh, uh, contact points within the country where we can make some progress. So uh, I, I don't accept the premise of the question that uh, we weren't standing up for ourselves. I think Canada has stood up for itself. It continues to stand up for itself. But there's ways of doing it that are going to be productive and serve Canadian interests. And there are ways that are doing that, that as I mentioned, are satisfying and serve set political agendas. But at the end of the day, don't lead you to where you need to get to. I would agree, actually, that um, we do need to have those dialogues. And I think we've got terrific people in the embassy in Beijing who will uh, help us do that. There are a lot of fronts where we can be talking to China, but we also have to listen carefully to what they're saying back to us. They have told our officials that Canada is not a middle power, we're a small power, and we have to stop leaning towards the US. And when um, the, our, the Chinese ambassador to Canada was um, asked now that you know Canada has been uh, had a different policy from the U.S. and we've been letting all the Chinese come in and uh, you know we haven't shut down our flights from China. Uh, is that changing the Canada-China relationship? He said no. Uh, we still have the same significant issue uh, related to Madam Meng that we had before. So it, the the relationship was not improved by those measures, which one would have thought would you know. Uh, soften them a little bit, but it didn't, didn't seem to. Well, you know, people say things at different times. I mean, I don't think anybody thought we would may wave a magic wand and make the Meng Wanzhou situation go away. It's, it's a very complex situation. Um, but tone does matter. And uh, the tone has changed somewhat, and in part because the previous ambassador, who was very hardline, is now uh, doing mouthing off in France rather than in Canada. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I don't know whether it's a question of personalities or, 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 uh, or nuance of the situation. But I do detect uh, that the tone has changed somewhat from the Chinese embassy, but certainly uh, if we expect these issues to be resolved overnight, they won't be. Mm -hmm. so you have to start on the journey. Very good. Uh, we've got a few questions here referring to Huawei and 5G networks. So I think we've probably all seen that the U.S. intelligence agencies are saying that they present a threat, whereas the UK intelligence agencies are saying that they can be used in, in some peripheral hardware. Um, what, is, what are your two's takes on Canada's use of Huawei technology in our 5G network? Margaret, you mind starting? Sure, um, and I wrote an op-ed on this in the Globe. Um, the UK announced that decision, which looked like it was a compromise. You let Huawei into part of the, your system, but not all of it, you protect the core, which is the, your sensitive stuff. But, and that's the way 4G works, and that's why Huawei in Canada is allowed on the edge of our network. 5G is completely separate. Um, under 4G, it's hardware that protects the, the core of the network. In 5G, it's software, which is um, more malleable and subject to uh, back doors and, and bug doors and, uh, and um, in fact, there isn't one single core. Um, the uh, system is completely diffuse across all of its functions. Uh, and that's because in the internet of things and things like autonomous vehicles, you can only make the, the speed faster if it's right very close to the consumer. And so you need to have that high sensitivity, um, uh, important uh, software out at the consumer and all over the country, not in one core. 
And um, after the UK decision came out, uh, there was a lot of technology um, exchanges in the UK, in the US, in Australia, saying this makes no sense. This is not the way a 5G system works. So um, the fundamental UK decision was wrong. And now we have uh, intimations that they're uh, looking, partly because of COVID, that they're looking at possibly undoing it. Um, well, uh, I've, I've also written a couple of things. And my basic position is that uh, I'm, I'm attracted to the UK solution for Canada because I think it gives us, if that's possible, the best of both worlds. It allows us to maintain a uh, significant level of, of risk mitigation, not zero risk, there is no zero risk, uh, but also allows us to access the industrial and technical benefits of R&D and Huawei. Huawei has you know, built on, it's been accused of stealing from Nortel, but it also bought most of Nortel's 5G patents and maintains significant R&D activities in, in Canada. So from a, a policy point of view, it's attractive, but there is the technical issue that you raise. And so after you wrote that article, I went and looked again at the British decision. And I think it's fair to say that uh, there's, no, there's no consensus on this. The National Cybersecurity Center in the UK has done an extensive study on this. It talks about the fact that uh, the, the edge the core is pushed out in 5G and uh, you know the, the myth that there's no difference between the core and the edge in 5G. And I'm a non-technical person, but I'm satisfied that they have dealt with this in a fairly convincing way. And presumably they convinced the UK government and GCHQ of that as well. Uh, I think we'll have to see if in fact, there is no technical way of, of controlling a high risk vendor, which the British classified Huawei is doing, then I would agree that the only solution is to keep them out. But I'm not convinced that it's a scientific reason. I think, I think it's more political uh, from the intelligence agencies and from US pressure to, uh, to, get, to get rid of Huawei, which may be in US interest, but I don't see it as being, to get completely get rid of Huawei as being in the Canadian interest. So, um... That's an interesting perspective. I, I don't see any of that as political. Um, I see it as looking at the, the facts. Um, in the UK, uh, their 4G has been assessed by their, that same national cyber uh, agency. And it found major national security flaws and holes and gaps in Huawei's equipment just for 4G and, uh, and insisted that Huawei fix it it's going to cost $2 billion and take three to five years to fix it. And that's starting very slowly. The, the, the company hasn't been moving very quickly on, on trying to fix it. That's just the, for the 4G they already have in place. 5G is much more um, ephemeral, uh, much easier to put something in from Huawei, um, China, uh, as a bug that can then shut down the system as a later date. And under uh, the national intelligence law, which was just brought in in China in 2017, it requires, first of all, that Chinese, for Chinese companies to spy on behalf of the state. Secondly, that they keep that spying secret. And third, that the government will support the company if they're found out. And so, you know, of course they would do this if, if they were asked by, by the Chinese government. The other thing I think it's important to see is how desperate is the Chinese government to have us accept Huawei? And we've seen in Germany, uh, their auto industry in China was threatened that it would be destroyed if Ger Germany didn't pick Huawei. In Denmark, uh, they were told that they would not get a free trade agreement with China um, if they did not pick Huawei. And just more recently, just in the last couple of days, it's been reported that uh, Huawei has threatened to pull their 4G out of Denmark uh, unless Denmark drops um, extra uh, security measures that they want to put in place. Um, in the UK, the ambassador of China threatened retribution if the UK didn't accept Huawei. The, our, uh, the Chinese ambassador in Canada has also threatened retribution. We don't know what specific threats um, they've made, but that's been reported uh, that they've been uh, threatening retribution. So we'd have to be crazy to just ignore those kinds of actions and proceed ahead to put a very complex system in place. Um, and then remember, 6G, 7G, and 8G will be put on top of this 5G. So once we've got Huawei into our 5G system, we've got it forever. Uh, I'm I, very I, just, I just made a couple of points in the interest of time. Um, 
those points you mentioned about the national security law in China and so forth are fully recognized by the British, which is why Huawei's classified as a high risk vendor. That's and right. their view is that a high risk vendor can be successfully managed within 35% of their network. Uh, and there's lots of technical issues uh, in, in involved in this. So uh, I, I, you know, I'm not prepared to second guess uh, th th those British experts. So I think uh, at, the, at the end of the day, the question is, is it technically feasible? Um, this, uh, their national uh, cyber agency seems to think that it is. Maybe they're wrong. If they're wrong, I'm sure the British won't proceed. If they can, they could. The other issue was that they make the point about diversity of supply. There are only two other major suppliers, Ericsson and Nokia, and that for security, uh, it's, it's, it's desirable that uh, no one supplier be allowed to completely dominate a network. But anyway, I think uh, you know, we, could, we could discuss this one all afternoon, and I, there may be other questions, and we're kind of running out of time. Yes, thank you. So, um, well, I just want to touch on something that was mentioned by Margaret in the last question. She, she spoke about the history of China using economic coercion. Um, if, if states are behaving in ways that they don't like, then they will take actions like we've seen in Canada, where they ban the import of certain Canadian agricultural goods. Um, does that like how how would a country like Canada potentially respond to a state that behaves that way? Should we be trying to isolate ourselves so that we aren't economic dependent on a country that often is 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 tempted to pull these levers of economic coercion, or is it to just ensure that we don't um, don't behave in a way that forces them to to do this kind of thing to us? Well, I pick up on Margaret's point about diversification. I think it's absolutely essential that to, that we diversify not only in Asia Pacific, but particularly in Asia Pacific or Indo Pacific, to use the new term, and that uh, uh, we we become less dependent upon. Uh, upon China. I mean, if we're dependent on anybody, we're dependent upon the U.S. And we see what happens there when the U.S. decides to put on steel and aluminum tariffs and so forth. So, yeah, we shouldn't become overly dependent. On the other hand, that uh, so we do need to diversify in Japan and other markets are good markets for us to explore. But there's still lots of potential for certain industries in Canada and China. I don't like the way the Chinese weaponize trade, but uh, and I'm not excusing it. But frankly, they're not the only ones that have weaponized trade. Just look south of the border. I would just add that our ambassador to China was asked at the Parliamentary Committee on Canada-China Relations how he would protect Canadian companies in China and, you know, the sensitivity and the problems they run into. And he said uh, the first step would be to diversify uh, away from China. And the Member of Parliament didn't understand his response. She was expecting something about the, uh, protecting inside. And so she was reframing her question. And he said, no, we have to diversify our trade away from China. So that, that speaks for itself. So in Canada, we've heard for decades about the importance of, of the Chinese market and how it's growing rapidly and by by um, integrating or taking advantage of some of the opportunities in China that will lead to economic growth in Canada. Um, but the opposite end of that question would be, what do the Chinese see as the benefit of their relationship with Canada, particularly in the longer term? Shall I start? Sure. sure. So one of the things that they want is our science and technology. And I've worked with them for many years on that. Um, when China was, con was behaving as a collaborator with China. Uh, since 2015, they've had a change of policy for Western technology companies, including Canadian companies. And this is one of the things I've spent um, most of the last two, two and a half years on, seeing what happened to specific um, behaviors of um, Chinese partners of Canadian technology companies. And we saw that, um, that they would, uh, in a joint venture, for example, uh, try to take over the whole joint venture over time. They would brand the technology in the name of the Chinese company. Um, they would uh, take measures for forced technology transfer where uh, the Canadian company's IP had to all be exposed to the Chinese partner, but the Chinese partner didn't have to expose anything to the Canadian partner. So a number of measures like this that they've taken, and uh, it's uh, a lot of uh, Western companies have had a problem with this, and uh, and I think 
you know, now we're seeing that Western companies are trying to move away from these forced uh, joint ventures because uh, almost invariably they come out on the losing end of it. Um, I'll just take another tag, asking what, what, what could China get out of Canada? Of course, China sees Canada as a place to invest, uh, access to the, uh, to the oil patch and so forth, which maybe is less attractive now. But also, I think is an in interesting point about um, food security and security of supply. Obviously, China has 25% of the world's population. It needs to feed these people. It needs to, it needs to have secure access to food. And I think it was very foolish of China to start uh, using canola and pork exports and so forth as retaliatory actions. We've now seen what's happened with African swine fever. The Chinese pork herd is, is hurting. They ha they've, they've, they've now started re-importing pork from Canada and elsewhere uh, for their own reasons. Uh, a game that Canada can play, I mean, maybe a game is not a strategy, a tactic that Canada can follow is is emphasizing our security of supply. We're one of the few countries in the world which has true excess, true surplus of food supply. Um, and this is something that could be attractive to Canada, to, to China and many other countries. Um, you know, Canada has not played the game of putting on embargoes as Cambodia and Vietnam and others have with rice. We have continued to supply food. We are a reliable food supplier. An argument has been made recently that we could have a good agri-food strategy that is based on security of supply to our customers, but we also want our customers to give us some security of access. And I think that's a that's a uh, an asset that we can that we can develop and we can use to advance Canadian interests. Great. So it is now 1245, which is the time by which we were supposed to wrap the webinar. However, we do have a backlog of questions here and some really good ones that I'd like to get to. So um, Hugh and Margaret, if you wouldn't mind, can we stick around and tackle a few bonus questions? Sure, that'd be great. Matt. Great. So for those of you who can't stick around, thank you for joining us. We will email you a link to the full recording. Um, but to the bonus questions, um, this one is, is, is talking about how the vast majority of Canadian citizens do not trust China. And here you, you mentioned that statistic that I think only 14% of Canadians had a positive view of China. As Canada is a democracy, how does this public sentiment constrain how our politicians are going to behave towards China, the rhetoric they'll use? Well, I, I think it's obvious. I made veiled references to certain political agendas of demonizing China. I, frankly, I'll be, I'll be more open. I, that's, that's a card that's being played in the conservative uh, leadership race at the moment. Um, uh, the Liberal Party has always been accused of being soft on China. I'm not going to say yes or no whether they have, but uh, I, I've always been a believer of engagement as, as, a, as, a, as a former diplomat. And I think that's been a consistent position of the Canadian government, actually both liberal and conservative over many years. But it does make um, blame and, 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 and demonization much more attractive when you've got 85% of the people that uh, have a negative view of the country that you're dealing with. And the government has to deal with it. It's an uphill struggle. Um, I think that, uh, you know, one has to be very careful not to be seen as an apologist for China when you're trying to make the case that it's in Canadian interest to try and find some commonalities. So that's the challenge that uh, any government faces. Now it's responsive to public opinion. It doesn't necessarily totally have to follow public opinion. It can help shape public opinion. But uh, uh, all governments have to get elected. And, you know, this is probably not uh, an issue that a government would rise or fall on, but uh, you know, it's part of the mix. Yeah, I, I guess I would just add that, um, you know, and, and Hugh has mentioned a number of times politicizing issues. This, I completely agree. These are, are not issues that are, that should be politicized. These are issues that are fundamental to uh, Canada's policies but they uh, should not be used as a bludgeon, a, a political bludgeon by any party uh, or any group. And, um, and I think instead, each party has to look at, uh, and the government has to look at China's behaviors. Um, and I would also say that to the extent that we are getting an anti-China um, rhetoric and, and, um, and sentiment across the country, I'm concerned about that because uh, that's going to redound onto Chinese Canadians. And in many ways, they're too being victimized by all of these actions by China. They don't like, to, the vast majority of them don't like to see it. 
Um, the last thing in the world we want is for other Canadians to look at Chinese Canadians and think they're somehow suspicious. Um, in fact, one of the problems that Canada faces, and I know the government is very seized with this, are the measures that uh, the Chinese part, uh, Communist Party has taken uh, in what they call their fr United Front work to um, uh, seed themselves into organizations across the country to um, be sure that there's a voice for China's policies coming from different organizations across the country. I think that's very uh, dangerous for Chinese Canadians and we have to be very, very careful not to feed into that. And the government has to be very careful in all cases to be speaking about China's behaviors, not some anti-communist rhetoric. Um, that doesn't get anybody anywhere. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the United Front and, and we have one question here, which says, uh, what are your thoughts on the United Front facilitating the export of PPE from Canada to China? I saw that article. I was uh, again like uh, I thought it was sensationalized. Frankly, um, this took place, as far as I remember, in early February when China was the epicenter, and uh, they were desperate to find supplies of, of materials to fight this epidemic. And the word went out to Chinese embassies, I guess, around the world to see what you can do to to uh, round up uh, supplies. And the word went out to the Chinese community, and uh, some community groups in Canada. Um, went and acquired material and sent it to China, at, which as I say was at the epicenter. I don't see anything particularly nefarious. You can paint it that way, but I think frankly, that's, that's an overreaction. And uh, as we have discussed, um, there have been reciprocal donations. There's been a flow back, both uh, as a supplier that we, supplies we purchased and supplies that have been donated. And yes, uh, Huawei or whoever else, Bank of China, I think, gave some some some, uh, some supplies. I know where there's a school here in Victoria where one parent gave some supplies. Are these all politically motivated? Perhaps some are, but I would point out that when Canada su gave supplies to China back in early February, the Canadian Embassy was very busy tweeting this out and making people aware of it. That's part of the nature of the game. I mean, uh, you do it for good, but you also uh, want to be seen to be doing uh, good as well. I agree with Hugh, and I, I don't see it as nefarious at all. Um, I think that um, a lot of Chinese Canadians and other Canadians uh, and the government of Canada were trying to help China get on top of what looked like it was a very quickly uh, exploding uh, disease, and they needed the stuff. And so if we could help, that's great. That's what Canada does. We step up and we help our, our friends and neighbors. Um, so I, didn't, I don't see anything nefarious. What I would like to see is donations back to us now that we really need it, not these $8 million, $8 million masks that can't be used um, and you know, other, other problems with supply. And I'd like to see gifts as we you know, gave, made donations to China, um, not gifts that come with photo ops for companies though. Well, thank you, Hugh and Margaret, for providing your insight today and to our audience for joining us and providing some excellent questions. Uh, the School of Public Policy will be hosting regular webinars on a variety of topics, so please keep an eye on our website to sign up as they get confirmed. Um, our next webinar is going to be next Tuesday at noon Mountain Time. The title is What Have We Learned So Far About EFTs in the COVID-19 Crisis with Ryan Clements. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, especially to our two experts for joining us today. Appreciate it a lot. So everyone, thanks. Thanks, take Bob. care. Good to see you, Hugh. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.